Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is brought to you by Strategies 2.0, a statewide collaborative funded by the California Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Today's webinar is Promoting Resilience Using a Two-Generation Model. The webinar is scheduled from 10 until 11.30 a.m. My name is Carrie Collins, and I will be your facilitator today. My role is to introduce the topic and our presenter, keep track of time, and to help the presenter and participants in any way that is needed. In a moment, I will introduce Todd to you, but first I want to go over a few of our webinar guidelines with you. So you all have a control panel, and you can control that with that red arrow there. So you can make that smaller just by clicking on that red arrow. You can join us today either by telephone or by your microphone and speakers in your computer. If you find that you're having difficulty hearing the webinar, then we suggest that you switch to your telephone. That generally gives you a little bit better of a sound. If you click on the telephone button there, it will give you a phone number to call into. It will give you an access code and a PIN number. So make sure you enter all of those numbers. We're going to communicate today through the chat box, which you all have. I appreciate those of you who already let me know that you could hear me okay today. So if you have any questions or comments that you have for Todd, please enter those into the chat box. Todd and I will be monitoring the chat box today. He will pause uh, during different sections of his presentation today to answer any questions that you might have. If you feel like you would like to ask the question on your own, all you have to do is click on this little hand icon, raise your hand, and I can unmute you so that you can ask the question directly to Todd today. All of you are muted, so don't worry about any of your background noises that might be going on in your office or in your home. I have everyone except for Todd and I are muted today. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Todd Sosna. Dr. Sosna and I have known each other for a long time, first uh, through my other role that I had in the Head Start program in Ventura County, and now through Strategies 2.0. He has such a wealth of knowledge around evaluation, strategic planning, leadership development, program design and management. Todd can actually make data fun and interesting. Um, I have been to several of his presentations, and it's just really been my honor to know him through the years. So at this time, I'm going to turn the time over to Todd. I'm going to make him the presenter right now, and then he will take over from here. Welcome, Todd. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Carrie, you can see my screen? Yes, I can, and I can see you. Okay. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Carrie. I will talk a little bit more about my background in a moment, uh, but let me do um, an introduction to the to the training for this morning. Um, so, the the training promoting resilience and using the two generation model. The what I'm hoping to do is make the case that a two generation, a dual generation model or a two gen model, um, which really focuses on a whole children, whole families, that's built on the, uh, the systems reforms that have developed in California and across the country to address fragmentation of services and impact of services um, it, um, is really needed if we're going to achieve enduring outcomes. So the case I'm going to try to make in today's presentation is that we can build on systems um, uh, initiatives that have done things like um, systems of care and wraparound to address fragmentation. We can build on evidence-based practice efforts that have been designed to improve outcomes. Um, but that using a tool generation model is really an essential characteristic if our goal is Sorry about that. If our goal is to have enduring outcomes, particularly for kids and families who experience a high level of trauma, uh, often because they live in, um, in low-income, high-crime uh, neighborhoods, uh, that we'll, we'll talk about more in terms of toxic stress. 
Um, so I'm really going to talk about the dual generation model as kind of a missing piece. Um, throughout the, the webinar, I'll start by talking a little bit about um, adverse childhood events, which I know folks know about, and resilience. We'll talk a little bit about systems reform, like distance of care and wraparound initiatives. Uh, and then we'll talk about how the dual generation model can incorporate those to achieve enduring outcomes in places where, as a service system, we've, cha we've been challenged to have those kinds of outcomes. Um, so it's interesting, I'll tell you a little bit about my background before I jump in, um, which sort of leads me to this work. So early in my career, I was with Santa Barbara County, um, and I led a children's system for care. This goes back about 20 years, and our goal was really to address fragmentation uh, and to include um, parent and family voice and choice in services. Uh, and we saw benefit of those systems of care that address that fragmentation, but we didn't see the level of impact that we wanted. Later in my career, I worked for the California Institute of Mental Health, and at that time, we disseminated evidence-based practices throughout California with the idea that if the interventions were proven to be effective, we would get better outcomes. Uh, and we did see big outcomes, but in the absence of a coordinated system of care, those outcomes are um, adversely affected by the fragmentation that systems of care and wraparound programs were designed to address. Um, and now I find myself working for a large nonprofit agency in Los Angeles, Children's Institute, where I'm their chief program officer, and we find ourselves adopting a, tool, a dual generation model that brings together the earlier work um, that I experienced personally and that the, the literature suggests is really necessary. So that's sort of an overview of where I hope we're going this morning. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, I will move through different sections of the material. I will stop and see if there are questions. I don't know if folks on, uh, on the webinar have done webinars themselves before, but they're a little bit challenging, uh, moving between my PowerPoint and the chat box. Um, plus, I can only see myself and I can't see an audience. So I will try to be patient and give an opportunity for you to submit your questions at different times. Carrie can unmute you and we can have a conversation or we can do it through chat. So let's just <clears throat> sort of talk, I'm gonna talk at a high level and then we'll, we'll revisit some of these topics in more detail. So I think everyone knows that trauma has a significant and enduring impact. I don't know that this was always understood. I think now um, as a consequence of the ACEs study, and of other initiatives, um, there's much more attention on the enduring impact of trauma. Um, and I think folks probably know from the ACEs study that adverse childhood events are common. And most people have experienced one or more adverse events, but a small number of people have experienced multiple events. And the more events that one has, the greater the impact, right? So changes in brain development and physiology, changes in emotional regulation, changes in appraisal and decision-making, uh, and, and either avoidance or risk-taking behavior. So we see this pattern, particularly when the adverse events occur when children are young and their brains are developing. And we now know that there are these neurobiological effects mediated by cortisol and other biological factors that are designed for a short, brief, um, response to help prepare the, the person to deal with something stressful, but that when they persist, they result in stressful changes in the brain, uh, changes the way um, people modulate and regulate their emotions, it changes the way they assess situations, the way they make decisions, um, it changes their uh, physical health, um, and that's complicated by risk-taking behavior, drug use, um, you know, and, and um, judgment kinds of issues. Um, one of my favorite studies in this area has to do with the way in which it affects appraisal. And so people are really good at judging facial expression. And what we've learned is that when people experience a lot of persistent stress uh, when they're children, the way in which they appraise threat, the way they read facial expression, um, changes. So that when a person with a low history of traumatic events in their lives, is asked to rate facial expression from, say, a happy face to a neutral face to a threatening face, um, 
they show what you know the neutral in the middle of the scale. But when an individual who's had a high history of trauma looks at the same set of faces, they see threat where other people see a neutral expression. So the scale shifts, and we begin to learn that the way in which people behave is in part based on the way in which they're assessing the situation. The way in which they're assessing the situation depends on their history of trauma. And um, so when we talk about looking at things through a trauma lens, we're talking about understanding the way in which trauma affects the developing brain, but in much more complicated ways than we had anticipated. Uh, and when that individual goes on to be a parent, then there are questions about what happens when an individual who experiences lots of childhood adverse events goes on to become a parent. Um, do they have the same resources to care for their children and have those early childhood experiences affected um, their readiness to do that? So the literature then talks about resilience. It talks about resilience as a way of buffering the effects of trauma. So they talk about protective factors. We talk about building resilience, um, with the idea being that when people have high resilience, they're um, able to bounce back from trauma more easily, uh, and that even when there aren't high resilience within the person, there's an ability to buffer or to, for there to be protective factors that cushion. So kind of like the way the, um, you know, sneakers with thick soles buffer against the impact uh, for a runner, right? And it absorbs that um, damaging sort of um, trauma from, from that runners get when, they, when they're pounding on the cement. So when we look at the literature and we talk about the kinds of, of protective factors, they sort of fall into categories. One of them is responsive and informed parenting. One of the common categories is social support networks. One of the common strategies is coping skills and the last safe, stable living environment. So as we look more into this, we'll begin to ask ourselves uh, how many of these protective factors that are important to buffering against the effects of trauma assume a level of financial resources um, for a, an individual who um, doesn't have a history of um, childhood uh, traumatic events. So to be a responsive and informed parent, is that adversely affected if one experienced a lot of trauma as a child? Social support networks, coping skills, safe and stable homes, how many of these things assume a level of financial resources and social capital which are sometimes not available um, when people live in low-income, high-crime neighborhoods and when they themselves have experienced a high level of uh, trauma as children. Um, so we get this sort of intergenerational um, effect of adversity. So um, cases are more common for children living in poverty and high violence. Sometimes the nature of that trauma um, is in their community. So um, uh, going to school, coming from school in the neighborhood where there are um, instances of people being violent, threatening with each other, and uh, people are fearful. Um, parents who have their own history and how that affects their parenting, how it affects their health, how it affects their interpersonal relationships, their decisions. Uh, oftentimes in low-income neighborhoods, uh, living situations aren't safe. They're not always comfortable. They don't always meet all of the basic needs. And folks don't always have the financial resources to have healthy food, a safe and comfortable place to live, clothing, resources, that kind of thing. Um, so children experiencing ACEs uh, and families living in poverty often rely upon and benefit from social services. And, but when those social service systems are fragmented, then it um, then that social service system no longer becomes sufficiently protective um, for those families who are most in need. So I suspect um, uh, those of us on this webinar are familiar with the kinds of fragmentation that can characterize social service systems. They're obviously not always the, uh, the case. There are lots of really impressive, innovative programs that have developed over the years um, in California, and outside of California. Um, but uh, there are also examples where fragmentation of services continue to be uh, challenging. So um, 
it's sometimes difficult for people to get the services they want. Sometimes the service system underestimates or doesn't understand the effect of trauma. So we see behavior in others the way we would see it in ourselves, but if our backgrounds are different, if we haven't experienced the same kind of uh, childhood events uh, and life experiences, then um, it's harder to understand how the decisions people make um, are influenced by that history. Uh, and service system as a whole, I think, tends to hold folks accountable um, without an understanding of the way in which their own life experiences are influencing their behavior. So the child welfare system and the, and the correction system often sees behavior as um, something that's bad and should uh, be stopped and can be stopped with threat of consequences as opposed to understanding it as being the consequences of trauma and offering the kinds of services and supports that can make a difference um, in, you know, in a person's um, life, whether that's a child or an adult, which we'll talk more about because that gets at the heart of the dual generation model. Um, there have been numerous reforms. Um, uh, a number of them very impressive in terms of their ability to overcome fragmentation to engage families and to promote outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit about those, uh, where they work and where they seem to have limitations. Uh, and then we'll we'll talk about in more detail the two generation program, um, which I'm really gonna characterize as whole child and whole family, um, uh, and which I'm making the case holds tremendous promise for building resiliency. Um, I think particularly among folks who experience toxic stress, a dual generation model is critical in terms of building protective factors and preventing and addressing trauma and adversity. Um, and uh, even more so when we're talking about situations where there is intergenerational poverty and trauma um, that happen in pockets, um, in, in pockets in communities all across the country. Um, and these um, high poverty, high trauma communities um, show um, intergenerational um, challenges. And so if we're going to help families overcome this, um, then we're going to have to use, at least in my opinion, a dual generation model. So that's sort of, that's sort of um, the case I'm trying to make. I'm going to go through in more detail and we're going to walk through um, each of those sections. So we'll talk about trauma and we'll talk about the service system. And at the end of each one, I'll take a break for questions. Take a quick peek. My screen. Okay. All right. Oops, sorry. Go back to seeing me. I don't know if that's what you want to see, but okay. I can see myself anyway. It's the one person I can see on the webinar. So um, I want to talk a little bit about trauma. Make sure that we all have the same shared understanding. So we can talk about a continuum of stress. At some level of stress, we'll call it positive stress, um, is uh, favorable and adaptive. So um, uh, mild and moderate um, pushes the individual. Um, they develop new skills, new confidence, new competency. Uh, and if it's within their ability or very near their ability, those kinds of challenges tend to build um, Build strength. So a little bit like, um, you know, a person who um, wants to exercise and they go and they work out um, and their muscles are sore the next day or the day after, and then they feel better and they can progressively do longer and longer workouts. Um, and over time, they build, um, you know, uh, muscle and they become stronger. There's tolerable stress. So tolerable stress is. Um, episodic, not persistent. It's beyond what would normally be tolerable, but we recover quickly. So maybe a person who's just started to run and has worked out a little bit decides they want to go on a marathon. And so they go on a marathon, but it's really too soon for them. They finish the marathon, but they're very sore. They're very tired. They kind of push themselves too much and they need some time to recover longer than normal. Um, but it's, it's uh, in a situation where there's not permanent 
there's not um, a permanent damage. But then you have toxic stress, and toxic stress is frequent, it's persistent, it activates the body's stress response, which I think as folks know now is heavily mediated by cortisol and other related um, neurobiological um, factors. And it does things like um, it moves um, blood into the muscles to prepare the person for uh, reacting, it causes the heart to beat faster, which uh, over time puts strain on the cardiac system. It also um, moves blood into the brain and in particular to help us make quick decisions and it improves memory, which is partially why when there are traumatic events, um, people recall them so, um, so vividly and that uh, presumably adaptive so that people learn to avoid those traumatic events. However, in the case of toxic stress, the trauma persists. And that reaction doesn't, that uh, stress reaction um, doesn't subside and there is no recovery. And over time, you see all kinds of uh, changes, biological changes, changes in the cardiac system, uh, thickening of the arteries because of the, of the rapid um, uh, heartbeat. And you see uh, traumatic memories, you see changes in uh, perception of threat, you see changes in decision making. You see sometimes avoidance behavior, but you also sometimes see risk-taking behavior. Um, a, a sort of a classic example is from the Deer Hunter movie, which of course is many years old now, and maybe not everyone on the webinar is familiar with it, but it has a character, uh, a, a, a Vietnam War movie, and has a character uh, who's experienced uh, post-traumatic stress and who uh, engages in a, in a risk-taking behavior in, in the movie. It's a, a Russian movie that kind of gambling game that the main character plays. But that idea of risk-taking behavior, that idea of um, uh, dealing with trauma by um, being um, uh, appearing to be not scared of the consequences, sort of um, being cavalier, is not uncommon. Um, and that stress can come from many places, that trauma. Sometimes people have trauma. It's completely unrelated to people, people, uh, natural disasters. Um, uh, sometimes they're unavoidable kinds of trauma, health issues. Sometimes um, they're hard to avoid, um, but not intentional kinds of acts, like car accidents. Uh, but you also have a trauma that can happen in your community. And so every day um, in high violence communities, kids and their, and their family members are exposed to traumatic events. Sometimes the trauma happens within the home. Um, it could take the form of domestic violence, a substance abuse by a caregiver, mental health issues by a caregiver. Um, and to the extent that the parent is the principal buffering resource for children, when the stress is in the home, it's doubly difficult because the stress or the trauma is occurring um, uh, in, the, you know, in the home and it sometimes um, as a result of the individuals who would normally be protected. Uh, I think folks are familiar with the ACEs study, which really drew attention to the health consequences and the enduring consequences of trauma. These are the 10 uh, ACEs items from the original study. Um, three of them abuse related, two of them ne neglect related, um, uh, and then uh, the rest related to caregivers. Um, I think it's important to understand that these 10 items aren't in and of themselves um, necessarily unique, that there were other kinds of traumatic events that could have been looked at. This just happened to be what was looked at in the ACE study. Um, I think the more important point is that the more of these things that happen, the greater the health consequences and the mental health consequences. Um, and to the extent that we don't take this into account, then often the services we provide aren't going to be a good fit for the, for the need. Um, and uh, this um, trying, uh, pyramid kind of illustrates the way the long-term consequences move forward from the experience to the cognitive impairment um, to the health, physical health consequences, which are, are both physical because of uh, stress-mediated changes in, in biological function, but also physical because of the decision-making, drug use, 
um, cigarette smoking, drinking, um, that often co- co-occurs with this. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, folks are dying considerably younger because of trauma history. Um, what's not illustrated in this pyramid that I think is important is the intergenerational consequences, the way in which the traumatic events in childhood influence the developing brain and that individual. And when that individual then becomes a parent, their decision making and their readiness for that role is affected. And you, and you run the risk of having intergenerational cases, particularly when we understand um, that the majority of the ACEs are related to caregivers. So the idea that a caregiver themselves experiences uh, adverse childhood events is, you know, is really an important factor, and I think begins to make the case for why dual generation programs are so important. Um, let me stop for a moment. Uh, and, uh, 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 at this point and see whether or not we have any questions related to um, just the notion of adverse childhood events, how they affect uh, folks, and um, how they um, result in long-term health, uh, mental health um, kinds of consequences. Carrie, I don't see questions on the chat, so there so may Jody not be has, any. Jody has her hand up. Okay. Um, I wonder if that means that I, I'm going to unmute her. Hi, Jody. Okay. I unmuted Hi. you. Did you have a question? Okay, good. No, I'm sorry. I put my hand down. I didn't realize I left it up. It was from <laughs> before when you were asking at the beginning of the of the presentation if we could hear you. Okay, right. got it. Thank you, Jody. So, so that's good. So we'll move on to uh, resilience, and then there'll be other opportunities for questions. So I think people talk about resiliency. So if a if an individual um, has experienced traumatic events, but they don't seem to show difficulty, we say, well, then that's because they're resilient. But when we go to define resilience and we begin to look at what does it take to create resilience in folks. Is it something you're born with? Is it something that you're taught? Um, that becomes a little bit more challenging, and it's, and it's the subject of ongoing research. Um, I went ahead and identified uh, a number of definitions of resilience just to frame sort of the conversation. So from the NCTSN, that's the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is uh, an initiative supported by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, federal agency which, by the way, have uh, a lot of information available for um, agencies and for people in the community about trauma and how to respond to trauma. They say that resilience is the ability of a child to recover and show early and effective uh, adaptation following a potentially traumatic event. Okay, so, so they have this definition that sort of characterizes it as an ability. The Prevent Child Abuse America, describes resilience as the ability to thrive, adapt, cope, despite tough and stressful times. Uh, they say it's the counterweight to adverse childhood uh, experiences. Uh, they say everyone has the ability to become resilient when surrounded by the right environments and people. Okay. And then um, uh, and then the uh, American uh, Psychological Association, the ACA right, Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threat, significant sources of stress. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. Resilience is not a trait that people either have or don't have, but involves behavior. So they clearly make uh, come from the perspective that it can be that it can be taught. Um, it's interesting because when we think about the human body, we sort of see a clear illustration of resilience. If you cut yourself, your skin will heal and the scab will form and then the scab will go away and the tissue will grow and you'll have no you'll have no sign of the, of the cut. Uh, if a person breaks their bone, you know, uh, you can you can put a cast on the bone, although it's not actually the cast obviously that heals the bone, just holds the bone in place, the bone naturally grows back. If uh, when when people are young when we are young, 
Our skin tends to heal quickly. Our bones tend to mend quickly. As we get older, we seem to lose some of the capacity. So our skin grows back, but it leaves scars. Our bones don't heal as quickly. Uh, when people are older, you know, concerned about people breaking their hip, where they recover from the hip being broken because our bodies don't heal as quickly. So in that regard, I guess we're, we're illustrating the way resilience works. Um, we, are, we are born um, with all of the capacity to heal ourselves. Uh, our skin heals, our bones heal. That capacity changes over time, diminishes, um, although there are things we can do in terms of a healthy lifestyle um, to, you know, to, to have that persist. And some people seem to have a, a greater capacity than others. People can have autoimmune disorders, other kinds of things that affect our normal natural ability to heal. Presumably, we have the same capacity to heal from emotional injury, um, but those seem uh, to be part, a function of the person's own capacity, the way they think about the event, the way they frame it, the way they soothe themselves, their ability to see hope, uh, even though things look challenging, uh, and the individuals around them, parents and social support systems, seem to be the factors that contribute to resilience. Um, but I don't know um, that the research is settled about what it takes to build emotional resilience um, in children and in parents to make them better able to support their children, um, particularly if they've been exposed to lots of adverse events which begin to diminish their natural capacity to recover from traumatic events, recover emotionally. So when you, uh, when you dig a little deeper into the research on resilience, you begin to see that, that there have been identified a number of kinds of factors that are associated with or thought to increase resilience. So social support, uh, safe and stable nurturing, self-care, so good nutrition, good sleep, relaxation, helping others, things to build resilience, a hopeful attitude, um, having meaningful goals, confidence in one's ability to affect change in their lives, competence, so having the skills to make those changes, flexible coping, so being able to adapt uh, when a problem is solvable, taking action, when a problem is challenging and doesn't have a straightforward resolution, dealing with the emotional responses, talking to others, a safe home, school, and a community, informal supports, uh, faith and civic organization affiliations, concrete supports, meaning things that people buy, like clothing, housing, public benefits, when people don't have the financial resources, counseling, parenting programs, school programs, after school activities, neighborhood and community prosperity. Um, the Center for the Study of Social Policy has done a considerable amount of work in this area. And they have um, developed the Strengthening Families uh, Framework. I think folks are probably familiar with this. Um, and they organize for, uh, protective factors into five categories. So parental resilience, social connection, knowledge of parent and child development, concrete supports, and social emotional competence in their children. So uh, if, we, if we look at these for a moment and we ask ourselves, um, how many of these are mediated by financial resources? How many of these uh, assume an individual parent uh, with strong emotional resources themselves and strong skills themselves um, and, and assume that people are living in situations where there is um, so a social support network? Um, and then if we look at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and if you haven't gone to their website on ACEs, uh, it's worth looking at. They have pulled together uh, a great deal of information. It's well organized. Uh, and they have this, um, this one slide that talks about what could be done. And from the CDC's perspective, these are the things that they think um, are proven at this point to help prevent adverse childhood events. So these are the kinds of things they think service systems and, and uh, social support agencies should be supporting. So home visitation programs 
and so here they're really talking about the Nurse Family Partnership Program, David Olds's evidence-based initiative, but there were also um, similar kinds of programs, Healthy Family America and other home visitation programs. Uh, the home-based um, Head Start option is another example of a home-based program. Parent training programs for the obvious reason that so many of the adverse childhood events and so much of protective factors are mediated by parents. And therefore, ha uh, parent training would certainly focus on parenting skills. I think there's also a question about the parent's own ability to have successfully address their own childhood traumatic events and the way in which um, they make decisions about their own life and, and the people in their lives. The third item that um, the CDC focuses on is in a, uh, intimate partner violence. And again, for people raised in high levels of adverse childhood events, um, decisions about who they spend time with, about who they rely on for social support, about who they um, date or marry, uh, is influenced by those experiences. Um, social support for parents, parent support programs for teens and teen pregnancy prevention programs, mental illness and substance abuse treatment, high quality child care, so again, like a Head Start program, and sufficient income to, uh, and support for lower income families. So it's really interesting and when we talk more about individuals who uh, live in low income, high crime neighborhoods and where there has uh, and, and where this extends across generations. Uh, the CDC essentially says this is a blueprint for how to address those needs. So if these are the things uh, that would be helpful to folks, then how would they access these services? Um, so when we put this all together, uh, I think um, it's important and helpful to ask ourselves, um, how are safe and stable living situations and basic needs, both of which are viewed as resilience and protective factors, um, how are those met for people living in poverty? When people have limited financial resources, do they have the ability to live in safe and stable housing situations? Um, and if they don't, then a large area of protective factors are going to be hard to you know, to fully address. Um, what are the consequences of a parent with high ACE score, which we have talked about before, which both affects their parenting skill, it affects their ability to manage their own emotional and behavioral responses, it affects their own risk-taking behavior, and it affects who they choose to associate with, their social support system. Um, and so the consequences for parenting um, when one has experienced early in their life traumatic events is significant. And we'll raise the question later as we talk more about what are we doing to provide parents the resources they need to address their own traumatic history as a way of better being prepared to meet the needs of their children. What are the consequences of low income, high crime neighborhoods? What are the consequences of implicit bias and institutional prejudice, particularly for um, kids and families of color um, and uh, this isn't talked much about in the ACEs, and it's not talked much about in the protective factors, but there's clearly significant research that shows that where there is implicit bias in service systems, in correction systems, in law enforcement, in, in uh, employment opportunities, in housing options, and where there's institutional prejudice, those uh, function as um, traumatic events in, in the lives of folks. And, for, and when you couple that with the low income and in a high crime neighborhood, you get a multiplying effect in terms of the adverse effect on the, on the kids and families. So before I move on to talk about the service system, let me take another short break uh, and see whether or not folks have any questions about um, the idea of resiliency and protective factors and um, you know, and, and what are they and, and how do they support folks? Carrie, do you see anything? No, let me, let me give you all an opportunity to enter any questions into the chat box. We did have one question about the PowerPoint being provided to participants. 
Um, currently, the PowerPoint and handouts are in your materials section of GoToTraining, but yes, it will be sent out um, via email to all participants, uh, the PowerPoint and the handout. Let me see if anybody has their hand raised here. I do not see a hand raised. Okay, okay. So I think we're okay. I'm going to move yeah. on. So uh, uh, I think that the, the point is if an individual, a child, a family, is experiencing a single area of need, the service system is, is, is more helpful. They can access services, they can get that need addressed in an otherwise um, fairly supportive context. But as people experience toxic stress, uh, and when that's intergenerational, when you have uh, poverty and place um, co-occurring, so pockets of intergenerational poverty, and when there is uh, high levels of violence in those same communities, um, you get this magnifying effect where the parents have experienced trauma as children, their children are experiencing trauma, whether it's in the community or in the home, and many times it's not in the home, but it is in the community, uh, and people don't have the resources um, to buffer against that. Um, then the degree to which the need for uh, assistance is high However, the system is not always easy to access. We'll walk through some of the things, and again, presumably this resonates with folks who, who have worked in the child welfare system or the mental health system and the school system and the correction system. So the service systems tend to be focused on a single problem area. So we have a mental health system that focuses on mental health needs. We have a correction system that focuses on uh, individuals who um, you know, violate the law. We have a child abuse system, which is designed to, to help families avoid maltreatment and to intervene when maltreatment occurs. Um, we have employment agencies that help people find jobs. Uh, we have housing agencies that help people find housing. We have the Head Start agencies that provide you know, child care and comprehensive services. But they tend to be single focus. Um, rarely are the systems whole person systems. They tend to focus on a single need so that you have a single individual. So you have an adult mental health system. You have a child mental health system. You have an education system for kids, public schools. You have an education system for adults, community schools, and adult education programs. You have employment programs. You have child care programs. But each of those programs tends to have not only a single area of focus, but a single individual in mind as the recipient of their services, and kind of eligibility criteria, levels of need. Um, uh, I think that folks have been challenged over time to get full participant involvement. So we talk about compliance. We talk about people uh, canceling or no-showing on appointments. When you're involved in uh, child welfare or the probation system, then, you know, social workers, probation officers, Judges are critical of folks who don't participate in services, you know, and the view is that they're not trying hard enough. Um, um, and, you know, and then we have uh, challenges for enduring change. So often we have services, but the services are time limited and they achieve some benefit, but the benefit doesn't seem to endure. And one of the uh, most compelling um, proof of that is, is the intergenerational poverty that we see in pockets of uh, a community um, that despite large levels of service and commitment to service and participation in services, um, we don't see sort of the, the enduring change. Um, oftentimes the service system also has in, insufficient attention to the challenges faced by low-income families. So this sort of judgmental stance that is sometimes characteristic of the service system doesn't seem to appreciate the challenges of being low income, of uh, not being able to get time off work without potentially losing their job, the challenges of having a record and not being able to get employment because one has a history of some kind of um, criminal behavior in the past, um, needing to um, work more than one job because one job doesn't provide enough income, needing to, to take kids to and from school, address one's own issues, 
uh, work one or two jobs um, while maybe trying to improve uh, one's own situation, going back to school, that one could get a better job while trying to take care of their kids. And, and that's the reality for people uh, in low income and doesn't even talk about if the same individual has an experience of uh, adverse childhood events, which would complicate um, all of those factors. So the service system has been historically fragmented. There, um, there have been reforms. Uh, again, I suspect many of us on this um, webinar are familiar with these kinds of reforms, um, um, many of which are good, many of which exist today, many of which are ongoing, um, uh, but, but maybe don't meet the whole need. So you have various system reforms. Um, that have, you know, um, been designed to address fragmentation, to provide whole person care. Um, so one is systems of care. Early in my career, when I was in Santa Barbara, we implemented the children's systems of care, uh, although it was centered around mental health and it was funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Now in Los Angeles, 20 years later, um, I'm involved with an agency that is also is part of a, a, a SAMHSA-funded system of care that focuses on mental health uh, and uh, children zero to five. So you have systems of care uh, that try to bring together um, agencies so that the services can be provided in a less fragmented way, um, but even then they tend to be focused on a particular problem area or an age group as opposed to a whole child and a whole family. Uh, another important Innovation has been wraparound. We see a, 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 a propagation of wraparound throughout California in the child welfare system and the mental health system funded by um, Mental Health Services Act and, and prior to that by Title IV-E, by child welfare funding. Um, and the idea here is rather than have the system create a system of care with memorandums of understanding and an infrastructure to support uh, collaboration, you build a collaborative plan around each and every child and family. So for those of us who have done wraparounds, you have a child and family team that convene periodically, maybe weekly, maybe multiple times a week. You have uh, social workers from child welfare, if the family's child welfare involved, you have probation officers, if probation is involved, you have school folks, you have informal supports, you have parent advocates, and they sit in the room and they form a holistic plan one family at a time. Uh, and uh, wraparound has been you know, hugely um, transformative. Um, there are restorative justice kinds of programs that look to change the way in which we approach folks who have had uh, involvement in the, corrective, uh, in the correction system. There's team-based decision-making. There have been one-stop centers, particularly designed to bring together providers from from multiple sectors, employment, health care maybe, mental health, so that families can go to one place to access services, again, I think have been um, very well received. All of these initiatives, and uh, again, I'm assuming many of us have had experiences with these, have strength, hold promise, have improved access, have improved experience of care, have improved coordination, uh, and have improved outcomes. So they, they've been um, powerful. Um, but probably not entirely complete in ways I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, there have also been reforms around involvement and promoting enduring change. And I think they take the shape of things like motivational interviewing, which is really designed to engage people into services, not because they're compelled to do it, because they're involved in child welfare or probation, um, but because they have their own you know, their own interests, their own goals that are discovered through a motivational interviewing process that motivate them to continue in services. If you can't engage folks, um, then uh, obviously our services won't have benefits and probably the families who are most in need of services, who struggle um, with the greatest number of issues, that find themselves in chaotic situations, who are less or least able to participate in services may be the very families that are most in need of services. So this issue of how to successfully engage people in services is really critical. You see that in Housing First initiatives and supportive employment initiatives. Um, 
and harm reduction strategies for substance abuse treatment, where the goal is really getting people into treatment and removing the barriers to access the services, so removing the condition, um, and also the movement towards evidence-based practices, which you see in schools, you see in mental health systems, you see in child welfare systems, you see in correction systems, with this promulgation of practices that have been researched and so on. Um, these advances have also improved program integrity and effectiveness and are also important. Um, however, these reforms tend to be focused within, not across the system. So wraparound initiatives within child welfare system or with assistance of care within the mental health system. They tend to be focused on children, or they tend to be focused on adults, but they don't tend to be focused on both at the same time. And to some extent, particularly in larger communities, we find ourselves moving from a fragmented service system to a system of fragmented systems of care. So there are multiple initiatives, multiple systems of care. And that many of us in agencies are members of multiple systems of care within the same community. So while systems of care and wraparound um, have been really instrumental in removing barriers to services, motivational interviewing and evidence-based practices have really made our services more effective when people are enrolled in services. Um, the innovation we haven't included is the dual generation innovation, the idea that we're gonna work with kids and their parents at the same time in a holistic way. So whole child and whole family services that build on system of care innovation, that build on wraparound innovation, that incorporate evidence-based practices um, so that we take the best of each of these efforts as opposed to the tendency to abandon one and move to the next. So um, before I move on to talk about the dual generation approach, uh, let me uh, take a moment and see if we have any questions now. Yes, Todd, we do have a question from Kristen Dempsey. She asks, okay. how can individual mental health providers address the larger systemic issues that create trauma and or limit access to services? Example, unequal and essentially segregated schools or lack of living wage. Even with good case management, it can be challenging. So I completely agree. Um, Honestly, I'm not sure that within the context of a single service system, like a mental health provider or a mental health system, we can fully address the whole issue. And I think that is, the, that is what we're coming to realize, that the effects of trauma are significant and enduring, that their impacts are not just emotional, but they're physical, they affect education, school completion, employment, and they can predispose people to intergenerational challenges. Um, and, and mental health, I think folks need to partner in the context of systems of care or wraparound programs. Um, later in the presentation, because I feel like I'm not giving you a completely positive answer, but later in the presentation, I'll talk about some small steps any agency can take or any service system can take to begin to expand this. I think there are ways we can take this information to change how we do our work that is beneficial. But I think ultimately to the question you're talking about, there needs to be a dual generation. There needs to be a whole child, whole family. There needs to be an appreciation that parents were children and their ability to parent, their ability to complete school, their ability to work and earn a uh, living wage has been affected and will affect their ability to provide the kinds of supports their children need to buffer against adverse events and to help their children do well in school and go on to um, find employment that allows them to have a living wage to move themselves out of um, a low income, high violence, high trauma communities. And that takes a holistic approach, employment programs, mental health programs for parents and for kids, housing programs, healthcare that have to be organized 
in a whole person strategy. And it is a significant challenge to our service systems that are not designed for whole person, whole family. They're really designed for individuals with a single area or maybe two areas of need. But when you have toxic stress, intergenerational poverty, our systems are really challenged. And, um, and that is exactly why I think, and so your question is sort of perfect. I think there are things mental health agencies can do, but I don't think they can successfully address the issue I'm referring to, this sort of toxic stress and a generational issue, without being aligned with other agencies and without um, implementing a dual generation model. So even, I guess the, the thing I would end with is you could begin to use that frame framework even if you're not able to provide the whole family services by yourself. I don't know if that's a complete answer. Any other questions, Carrie? Yes, we have two other questions. We have one from Rebecca Campbell. Um, are the curriculums tested and validated for effectiveness being used to help develop or teach resiliency and cultivate protective factors? So that's a good question. I'm not aware of a particular cur curriculum that's proven for resiliency as a general concept. There are certainly curriculum um, that have very strong evidence um, for how to improve parenting skills. Um, for example, um, Triple P Parenting, uh, Incredible Years, um, uh, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, extremely strong research base for those parenting skills programs. And there's some good research for evidence-based practices for parents addressing their own trauma histories. And so here I'm thinking about child-parent psychotherapy, where the parent uh, works with um, their infant or toddler and addresses um, their own history and how that affects their parenting or reflective supervision as a strategy. So there are good and proven curriculum for parenting and to strengthen parenting, which is itself a protective or a resilience factor, um, which would go a long way for helping um, this situation. But I don't know of a curriculum that's proven that necessarily creates um, the general concept of resilience. I don't know if that makes sense. What was the last question? Um, from Andrea Calderon. We at Head Start use two generational, use a two generational approach and run into issues all the time with silos. Agencies have good intention but want to address issues according to their agency plans that usually are not aligned with others. How do you think one can address, how, how do you think we can address this? So that is a really great question. I'm not gonna answer it in this moment because uh, this question provides me a great segue to my next couple of slides and then I will come back to answer it. So I will do that and I'm gonna hold off for a moment just because of time and then we'll come back. So. That was an excellent question, it's a nice segue. I will come back to the answer. The two generation approach is an approach, it's a strategy, and it's a program. And so each of us, depending on wherever we're, we're working, could adopt the approach. You might also be in a position to adopt a strategy or a program. So, so again, I want to say that there's value in just having the approach in mind even if you're not necessarily in a, in a situation to implement a, two, a dual generation um, program. And you could implement a strategy, even if it's not a comprehensive program. So there are stages. So to your questions, uh, to, your, to the previous question, the Head Start program is in fact considered the first of the true uh, uh, dual generation program, um, which was designed to create a legacy of economic security that passes from one generation to the next. This was the original idea. And the Head Start program goes back to 1965 and the Johnson administration. And if you've never read the act, it's really um, fascinating. Uh, and it could have been written today. Uh, the same issues and the same dynamics that were talked about in 1965, you know, you could take right off of the headlines from today's newspaper. Then in the mid 90s, the Foundation for Child Development actually coined the term dual generation, so it has been with us for a while. 
However, early efforts were hampered and the integrity and the quality of programs were poor or challenged. And so even though we had dual generation concepts, we didn't always have the funding necessary to implement a dual generation program. So to the earlier question, our Head Start programs in this country have never been sufficiently funded to fulfill what's referred to as comprehensive services, which is the dual generation component. So even though it has the mandate, it doesn't have the funding to implement it, and Head Start programs are reliant on community agencies to fill in the gaps, and then you run into the fragmentation that was talked about in the earlier call. The Annie Casey Foundation and the Aspen Institute are now both current contemporary champions of dual generation models, and much of the material that um, I'm going to be sharing comes from, from their work, which is ongoing. So uh, intergenerational poverty and adversity. So again, I'm not telling anyone anything you don't know, but if you live in poverty, you have housing insecurity, you have exposure to violence, you have limited educational opportunities, uh, which will affect a mental health and physical health. You experience implicit and institutional prejudice, and you see disproportionate involvement, particularly uh, for, for kids and families of color in the child welfare and correction system. Um, these statistics, which come from the uh, Annie Casey Foundation and the ASCEND, ASCEND is part of the, an initiative of the Aspen Institute. This is some of the statistics they use to make the case for dual generation. Some of this is just a little bit dated, just a couple of years old, but actually still probably pretty accurate. Less than half of low-income children are ready for kindergarten. That's opposed to 75% um, of the kids who have families with moderate to high income. So one out of every two kids aren't prepared to go to school. And if you're not going to do well in school, it's going to be difficult to go on to complete high school, go to college, and get the kind of jobs that generate the kind of incomes that create a living wage. Low-income parents with young children are three times more likely to report having poor mental health as opposed to uh, parents with higher incomes. And of course, if parents have poor mental health, that affects their capacity to take care of their kids. 42% of children raised in low-income families remain in low-income families. And I think this is uh, perhaps the most significant factor that we've been talking about, which is the large number of kids born into poverty who continue to live in poverty. And I have there this web link um, to something called the Opportunities Atlas. I don't know if you have been to the Opportunity Atlas, but if you haven't, you should go. And the Opportunity Atlas looks at this notion of the American dream as defined by earning more, children earning more than their parents. And at one time in this country, the majority of kids earned more than their parents, each generation earning more than the generation before them. However, in the last couple of decades, it plateaued. And in some communities, the likelihood of earning more than your parents um, no longer is a reality. And if you go to the Opportunity Atlas, you can look up any zip code, any community, and you can see the, um, the likelihood that your children will earn more than your parents and it shows how much people earn. And what you see is we have pockets of wealth and pockets of extreme poverty, um, uh, and they're near each other all over the country. So you see it in California, you see it in Kansas, you see it in New York. Um, where you have both opportunity and lack of opportunity that seems to be related to place. Um, and this is where you have these pockets of intergenerational poverty, uh, high violence, high trauma, uh, and a relatively little mobility from the children raised in those communities, which is really driving us to think about dual generation and place-based initiatives. 41% of all children in the U.S live in low-income families. Again, that's a little bit dated, but not way off. For low-income families with children under eight, 45% are single parents, as compared to 17% for more affluent families. 18% of parents have difficulty speaking English, as compared to only 4% for more affluent families. 21% are parents with an associate's degree or higher, compared to 68% for more affluent families. 50% of parents with full-time year-round income compared to 88%. And 14% of the parents are under 25, as opposed to 4% for more affluent families. 
So the challenges and the effects of that are evident in, um, in our understanding of what's going on for kids and families. Obviously, kids thrive when their families thrive. And so the, the notion of dual generation programs is the dynamic and synchronistic interdependence between kids and parents. So that um, parents will do things for their children that they won't necessarily do for themselves, and children emulate their parents. And so there is this dynamic and this synchronistic effect that you get in a dual generation program that you don't get in a single focus program. So parents who complete college double their income. Parents' level of educational attainment is a good predictor of their children's success. Uh, Low-income mothers who enroll their children in childcare were 40% less likely to be depressed. So these factors, uh, uh, this sort of, and, and this is not a complete picture, but we haven't looked at, you know, not all, not all of the factors have been researched, but it's beginning to form a picture. Um, but even little investment, the $3,000 difference in a parent's income when a child is young is associated with a 17% increase in the child's future earnings. Children with money and savings account are three times more likely to attend college and four times more likely to graduate. So, um, so what's being pointed out, and, and again, this research comes from the Annie Casey Foundation and the ASCENS program, is that um, there's a interdependence between kids and families that can be leveraged to help address the issues of toxic stress and intergenerational poverty. Um, so two-gen approaches build on the things that we've been talking about. They need to build on interagency collaboration. They need to build on all of the work around individual family voice and choice and cultural humility and the importance of informal support systems and evidence-based practices and trauma-informed systems um, to advance this notion of whole child, whole family, economic security, safety, and wellness which then goes about building the resilience and addressing the adverse childhood events. And that is really, in a nutshell, the, the thesis. I wanted to share with you what the ASCEND model, and again, the ASCEND model comes from the Aspen Institute, and they're a big proponent of dual generation or two generation model. Um, and they talk about five areas of focus, early childhood education, post-secondary education and employment pathways for parents, economic assets, so the assistance one has to meet their basic needs, uh, safe housing, health and well-being, like mental health, emotional health, and social capital, which in this model is not just social support, but is social capital. It's the way in which your social support network advances your economic outcomes, the way in which your family member got you your first job, got you an interview, the way in which um, the people from your college um, the friends that you made went on to, to have careers and you stayed in contact with them and that led to you having economic opportunity. That's what they mean by social capital. And so uh, the Aspen Institute really believes that focus on these five areas, early childhood education and employment, asset building, health and wellness and social capital, which looks similar to the strengthening families protective factors and again, they talk about this notion of reciprocal and synchronistic, meaning simply that parents will do things for their kids and kids will model their parents. And that when parents are healthy and take care of themselves, both physically and emotionally, and have the opportunity to advance educationally or in terms of employment or the benefit of public assistance, they're in a better situation to meet the needs of their children. And when parents do things like go to school, they're showing that schooling is important. And they're modeling for their children the importance of going to school and doing well themselves. Parents are motivated by children, and children model their parents, simply put. Uh, and the notion of dual um, generation uh, services is that services are both child and parent focused. So, uh, that advances both economic stability and wellness, that there's family teaming, that there's coordination, that you're using research informed interventions. And there's a notion, and you see this in all of the dual generation literature from the Aspen Institute, about the importance of measuring and being accountable. Okay. Um, so, we talked about this, uh, this idea of, of services being simultaneous and synchronistic. And I'll come back to say that sometimes 
A dual generation approach can be done within an agency, if you're a multi-service agency. Oftentimes it's done across agencies, um, and that's where this notion of collaboration and wraparound kinds of efforts need to be put together. Um, this slide sort of illustrates, it comes from the Aspen Institute, the logic model, um, which I think really il illustrates how you have at the top parent goals, parent interventions, parent participation, parent health and wellness, and at the bottom, child goals, child interventions, child participation, child health and wellness, and the synchronistic effect between the two, which gives you these long-term and enduring outcomes. This is exactly the idea of the dual generation model. And for parents, you have health, you have mental health, you have their own trauma, you have their own educational goals, their own employment goals, their own interpersonal goals. And for children, a parallel set of goals that need in a whole child, whole family model to be simultaneously addressed if the families we're working with experience toxic stress. So what would that look like in practice? So assessment, and we all do assessment. If I was whole child and whole family, I would look at assessing health insurance for the parent and for the child, medical and dental care for the parent and for the child. Are there any medical conditions? If so, are they being handled, managed correctly for the parent and the child? Are there developmental disorders that the child is experiencing, substance abuse concerns? for the parents or for the youth. Emotional wellness, the parents' emotional health, the child's emotional health. Trauma history, the parents' trauma history, the child's trauma history. Housing, is it safe? Is it stable? Economic resources, can they meet their daily needs? Child care, the child in a place where they're learning and being supervised. Educational advancement for the parents, employment for the parents. Any legal issues, immigration issues, old arrests that are barriers to employment, social support for the parent, for the child, social capital for the parent, parenting skills for the parent, school engagement, educational attainment, after school interests and opportunities. So all of these things would be areas for assessment. If you were whole child and whole family, you would be looking at all of these areas, not one of these areas. You would say, I don't address all these areas in my agency, which is fine. Then you would account for it and then partner with other agencies to put something cohesive together, which is, in fact, the reason for systems of care and wraparound. What would my treatment services look like? What would my care planning look like? I might be helping someone get Medi-Cal or healthy families insurance or linked to the California exchange because of the health insurance. I might be assisting with care management for accessing or attending to a health condition. I might have a promotorious program to help support health care, care management program, a regional center, a special education program for developmental disabilities, a substance abuse prevention and treatment program. I might need to make use of mental health services housing authority, housing support, tax credit, public assistance, food program, high quality child care, early head start, head start, community college programs for adult education, job development programs, supportive employment, TANF or CalWORKs program. I might have legal assistance, support groups for social support, peer one groups, clubs, neighborhood groups, faith and civic organizations, parenting classes, school participation opportunities, after school, community active, uh, advocacy for collective impact so that people can advocate, to organize and advocate for themselves. And I know it sounds like a lot and you're looking at this and you're thinking, I don't do all this. Our agency doesn't do all this, which I understand. No one agency does all this. And this is the challenge. The challenge is we're fundamentally not set up to do whole child for family services. But if we want to address toxic stress, if we want to address intergenerational poverty, then we're going to need to be able to build either around an individual family in a wraparound model or through a system of care the capacity to address these problems. And when we address only one area or one generation, the child or the family, we may get some favorable outcomes, but the likelihood that they will endure is limited. Um, because of the effects of toxic stress and the way in which that toxic stress affects so many aspects of one's life, which we talked about early on in the presentation. 
And you would focus on two generation outcomes, kinds of things we've been talking about that lead to resilience and lead to protective factors. I have included a link at the bottom of this slide to Northwestern University, which has a whole website devoted to research on two generation programs and their outcomes. A great place to, a great resource. So now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, this sounds like it makes sense, but it's too much, it's too big. Well, I'm going to talk about first steps. And this gets to the question uh, from the individual who asked about mental health services and to the question I, I didn't really answer um, from the individual in the Head Start program, which is first step. The first step is to think in terms of dual generation, to have that mindset, to appreciate the concepts and to have that frame the work, and then to incrementally or in small areas build small examples of dual generation programs. A mental health agency that serves children can provide potentially mental health services to their parents. So I work for this agency in LA County. We have for decades been a child only mental health agency. And in the past year, we began to provide mental health services to the parents of our children, whole generation. We're a, a Head Start program at employment services. A mental health agency that partners with a Head Start agency where you're providing both mental health to children, mental health to parents, Head Start parents, and parenting classes to parents. Mental health, employment support, and housing being combined into a single program. I've included this link to a YouTube video that will, um, you, where you'll hear from people all over the country who have been implementing dual generation programs. I would show it to you, but it actually, uh, on this webinar, doesn't, it's not going to be reliably visible. So later when you get this presentation, go to this link and you'll hear from people who are doing dual generation work, like the examples I just gave all over the country. Implications. There are implications for the two gen model on how your work is framed, how you publicize it, how you talk about it, how you and your staff understand it. There are implications for how you design your program. Maybe you can't do everything. Probably you can't do everything. But if there's some small area where you can move from a single focus to a dual generation focus. There are implications for who to collaborate with. There are implications for how you evaluate. And there's implications for funding. So the Administration for Children and Families, the federal agency that funds Head Start, among other things, the WK Kellogg Foundation, and the United Way all have funding opportunities for dual generation programs. So as recently as a month or two, I did a search, and they all have two gen funding applications. In terms of changing the conversation, change the way the services are, are accessed, taking an intergenerational approach, beginning to talk about building resilience from a strengthening family, both a parent and a child approach. I think so much of our child welfare system, so many of our programs are child focused and view parents sometimes as the cause of the problem. And even when we view them as the solution, and we offer them parenting and other kinds of services, we often do it without fully appreciating the effect their own trauma history in their own childhood has affected the way they interact and the way they are in the world, which can have profound effects. So, and I'm gonna recap and then I'll open up for questions again. This is sort of a, a synopsis, right? Adverse childhood events are common and they have long-term impact much broader than we anticipated, much more significant. Protective factors and resiliency are important in buffering against the adverse effects of trauma. Frankly, we all come into the world resilient. Our bodies are able to heal themselves, both physically and emotionally. A lot of that emotional capacity is within the context of a family. We are inherently social creatures and we resolve emotional damage through social interaction with caregivers. However, your caregivers aren't available to emotionally provide that support because of the consequences of their own childhood trauma. You can see intergenerational poverty and trauma, particularly in pockets within communities that is persistent 
and complicated and stubborn to change. And that our service system, while positive for people with a single area of need, are extraordinarily challenging when you have toxic stress and complicated needs. And that we really need, in my opinion, to be using a whole generation, whole child approach that begins to understand the interplay between parents and children and the importance of meeting parent needs, mental health needs, substance abuse needs, educational needs, employment needs, and housing needs, social support needs, and social capital needs, so that the parents can model for their children the importance of education and employment and social relationships and sound judgment and can provide for their children the emotional support that will allow them to recover from the inevitable trauma we all experience, but in particular, the toxic trauma that occurs in some uh, of our communities where there's a lot of poverty and a lot of violence. I want to mention before I open up for questions that there are resources that uh, are also available through this webinar. Here I'm showing you only the cover, um, but the whole PDF um, uh, apparently are, uh, are available for you to download. So these are all public domain. Uh, this is from Interface, Beyond Trauma, Building Resilience to Adverse Childhood Experience. Actually, this is a publication supported by Strategy 2.0. Uh, and it does an excellent job of providing an overview of trauma uh, and resilience and uh, is really a good primary resource if this is an introduction to the topic that you want to make available to somebody. This is from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. There's a, uh, a paper that they published on their protective factors framework. Again, you may already have this, and it's an introduction to the topic that is worthwhile if you're unfamiliar with it. This is the Ascend uh, project of the Aspen Institute that is driving this dual generation initiative. Um, uh, and they've done a really nice job of making the case, um, lots of graphics, and um, not very much, not heavy on narrative. And it's really designed to provide an introduction to why a two generation approach is important. And this comes from uh, the Annie Casey Foundation, it's their policy report. Um, and it talks about creating the opportunity for families using the two-generation approach. And it is their articulation of why this is important. And the last resource that you're, I'm afraid you can't download, um, but, you, but you can purchase, uh, is this book written by Suzanne Bohan, 20 Years of Life, um, Why the Poor Die Earlier and How to Challenge Inequity. So this is a publication supported by the California Endowment that, um, talks about their 10-year investment in improving health outcomes by improving um, community living situations and advancing collective impact efforts. But she does a really great job in this book of talking about the, the research around trauma and the way the trauma affects folks and the importance of collective impact and addressing um, factors in, in low-income communities. It's quite compelling not really a dual generation focused book, but it does talk about trauma and collective impact, which can be important to addressing some of these factors. Um, and if you have an interest, it's, it's worthwhile um, to read. So, um, so with that, I'll open up for questions. Carrie? Okay, do we have any last questions for Todd? And I'm gonna take back the controls. I think I'm going to take back the control. Where am I? Here I am. Last chance to ask questions. I want you all to know that this webinar will be uploaded into our Strategies 2.0 YouTube channel so that you can share it with other people. Um, all of our webinars and past webinars are in this library as well as our learning community uh, and our vehicles for change webinars I'm not seeing any questions i also want you all to know that an evaluation will be sent to you automatically following uh as soon as we dismiss from this webinar we ask that you please 
complete this. It really helps us in our in our future preparations for webinars. Um, we will send. Please also send the materials sent in the email that allow us to join. I will not be able to access them. Okay. So you will you will receive the materials. Uh, via email, you will receive the link to this particular webinar uh, sometime next week, probably sometime next week. I also want to remind you that Strategies 2.0 does offer a series of trainings at no cost in the state of California. One of them is Protective Factors Training. So if your agency has not had that training and you are interested in that, please go to our website at www.strategyca.org. And you can see all of the um, all of the trainings and webinars and learning communities that we offer. One change we have in working across service sectors is the issue of funding and who is paying for what. Any suggestions yeah. on how to overcome the fiscal barrier? That's from uh, yeah, Michael that, Kapp, Michelle Cap. Yeah, that is a particularly that's a good question. Uh, and it's a challenging issue. There are a number of ways to go. Uh, I have seen agencies um, who are multi-service agencies, so they have funding from um, from multiple agencies. So they try to build it within themselves. I've seen effective systems of care, which is collaborations between agencies that blend or integrate or braid different different terms. Uh, money, so they pool money together around a community. So take, for example, the Harlem Children's Zone effort in New York around a place-based strategy. The third, um, I think, opportunity, even though it's not an easy opportunity, is to create change through legislation and through advocacy to get yeah. um, the service systems to be funded in such a way that it recognizes a whole child and a whole family approach. Um, but it, but it is, it is definitely challenging and there is no easy strategy. It is either done in my experience through a system of care, uh, through a wraparound where you bring representatives and multiple agencies together and they agree to commit resources on behalf of an individual family. You build it yourself through a multi-service agency or you get legislation changed to sort of require, um, Funding be used in a more holistic manner. Those are the, the four approaches. But um, if that doesn't sound like a completely helpful answer, I understand because it is a significant challenge. Right. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you to all of you who joined us today. I know many of you are probably in a room with with other people. Um, you're getting some great responses, great topic and resources. Would love more on the same or related. Oh, we have another question. Another issue is poverty guidelines. Family of two is over income if making twenty two thousand a year. How can we yeah, this, improve access to services? Yeah, yeah this sounds like a, a head start provider question. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and, and there's two issues with, with the way Head Start is funded. One is the cost the 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 uh, rate per child in a head start is, is the same across the nation. So there's not funding specific to cost of living in different communities. So in California, it's very expensive um, and not the same as in the middle of the country. And then the other issue is, is the, the poverty threshold, again, because in California, that threshold is, is, is different than there's other parts of the country. The, the poverty guideline is such that, you know, it's very hard for people um, in California, $22,000 wouldn't be anything. It wouldn't be rent. It wouldn't be childcare. Um, but in another part of the country, that's a lot more money. I think the answer there, and it's not going to be an answer that you necessarily like, is we have to get to ACF. We have to get them to change the guidelines. We get to get them to use regional uh, cost of living and regional poverty definitions and regional yeah. funding. They do have a new director who might be receptive to that, but it would definitely require advocacy to get Head Start to change it. Head Start is a dual generation model in design. It is not funded to uh, allow Head Start providers to do it properly. So I, I understand your challenge, but I don't have a particularly good answer. Right. Oh, 
Well, let's just all keep doing the great work that we're doing out there and send, send out your letters and concerns to those that will listen to you. So thank you so much, Todd, for being with us. It was a real honor to have you on with us today. And thank you to all that are participating. I'm going to sign out for now. So uh, please go in and check out when our next webinars are. So thank you very thank much you. for participating today. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.